let me introduce our guest for the evening. Alyssa Bowman is a professional writer, editor, and book collaborator. She's uh, written a number of books and co-authored books, seven of which have landed on the New York Times bestseller list and sold millions of copies. Um, and even though she said, I shouldn't say this, I'm going to say she's been voted as one of the most inspirational women bloggers by Reader's Digest magazine. She's also made many television appearances on shows ranging from The Today Show through Discovery Health and many more. Um, but most relevant for tonight's purposes, she is the parent of a transgender child. She's also an advocate and the co-author of the book, Raising the Transgender Child. And I'll also say that she is my friend. So with that, please welcome Ali Bowman. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be here. I do wanna say one thing. I have three dogs that are all roaming around my house. And one of them in particular is um, attracted to Zoom. So you may hear some panting right behind me. And I just want to let everybody know that the panting is not me. For some reason, it feels important for me to say that. But um, uh, that said, um, I am very happy to be here and to talk about tonight's topic, which is um, uh, families of trans kids have to come out too. And um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is why, because if you're not um, currently raising a transgender child, you might wonder like, um, why would you, why would the families need to do that? Um, isn't that what the child does and, and so forth? So I just wanted to get into that first um, and also tell a little bit about um, my background, just so that you have a, a sense of who I am and where I'm coming from. So um, my son um, happens to be uh, a transgender person who basically always knew who he was um, from the youngest age, uh, was very masculine in, uh, I would say like um, daycare. And I, but at the time I didn't know, um, this was a long time ago and I didn't even know the word transgender back then. So I just thought, um, I had a very masculine girl that liked stereotypically boy things. And it didn't really even occur to me to question things like, why does my child prefer to in restaurants to run into the men's room to use the bathroom, for example, or why does my child, um, you know, always make up different names on we that are uh, boys names instead of um, his given name. Um, and, and so like eventually I, it wasn't really until um, just before first grade that um, we went to see Dr. Michelle Angelo um, outside of Philadelphia. Um, at the time, she was one of the few therapists who specialized in um, these kinds of gender issues. And uh, it was pretty soon after that that I, I started understanding the science and who, who my child really was. Um, and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, I don't know what it is with Dr. Angelo, but we sort of hit it off and became friends, even though she, um, she was our family therapist for years. And so she and I worked together on raising the transgender child book. And I brought the perspective of a parent and she brought the um, perspective of a therapist who has worked with many um, families and transgender people. Um, and I will say that I, wrote the book hoping that people would be able to give it to their family members when they were coming out just to make the coming out process a little easier. So um, the thing with um, when you're raising a transgender child is that they can't really transition without the people around them knowing that they're transitioning. So it's not like um, gay youth who can stay in the closet until they don't wanna be in the closet anymore. Um, like when my son transitioned socially, it happened over a period of years um, because it's some it's socially acceptable really for uh, what people think of as a girl to look like a boy. So very few people um, questioned it. Where whereas I think the other way around, I, I would have had to have come out sooner for him. But um, I didn't start telling people until maybe a couple years after we knew. Um, and, and we, we very slowly told the world. Um, and so one of the first people we told were very good friends and I hadn't really planned it. And I don't really, um, 
necessarily recommend this technique to others. It's just sort of what happened. I was so uncomfortable with telling people and so worried about what they would think and, and really um, scared that they somehow would reject my child. That was probably my biggest fear. Um, so we had a couple over, they were very good friends. I, I knew their politics and I was like, I would say 98% sure that they would react positively. But, you know, it took me three or four glasses of wine to actually get around to saying what I wanted to say. And I don't even remember exactly what I said, something about, you know, um, well, our daughter is really our son now. And they just, you know, were like, oh, that's wonderful. Congratulations. And hung, hugged our son. And it really went well. And, and it, looking back on it, I think we were a little bit fortunate. Um, I would have liked to have planned <laughs> the encounter a, a, a little better than what I did. But that said, it, it went well. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, if you know your child is trans at a young age, as their parent, I, I feel like it's if you want to raise a happy, healthy child, I'm sorry, my dogs are dropping things on the floor now. Um, if you want to raise a happy, healthy child, you're going to want to do some of the hard work for them and move some boulders out of their way. And so one of the things that you can do for your child is um, work with them to make a decision of, are we going to come out or are we going to move? Because those are your, basically your choices. Otherwise, because if you just transition, everybody's going to know that um, the person who was in school last year had a different name than the person who's coming to school this year. And whether or not you tell people, they're going to know that something's different. Um, so we chose to stay here and transition publicly and tell people, kind of always knowing that moving and going stealth would be in our back pocket if we needed it. And, um, you know, one of the things that I didn't really understand right in the beginning is that you don't come out just once. <laughs> you come out over and over and over again for a period of years because, um, you know, you, your social circle keeps expanding and changing. And um, even though you think everybody knows, you always meet that one stray person who doesn't. Um, and so, you know, I, during the, what I'll call the first coming out, um, I, you know, was pretty, uh, I, I, I put a lot of thought into, for example, telling my son's Kung Fu teachers and his, his teachers at school and the parents of his friends. Um, and then our family, like, uh, you know, here's, here's our son introducing our son to you and then giving them some pointers of how to be good people is, is sort of how I came out. And I always did it in writing because that's my skill. I, I as you can probably tell, I, I don't talk all that effectively, but I write pretty effectively. So, um, those encounters, the initial ones all went pretty well. I'll, I'll get into some that didn't. Um, but I do just want to um, go into a few things that are part of the coming out process that I think a, a lot of people don't realize. Um, so in addition to telling people who your child is, um, you're also going to eventually help them legally. Um, at least I did. I felt like this was really important. I didn't want my son to wait until he was 18 to um, do this for himself. I wanted it to be done so that he didn't have to think about it when he got his driver's license, for example. So we went to court to legally change his name, um, which I believe is easier now than it was when we did it. Um, I had to go back twice to convince the judge that it was in the best interest of the child. I, I don't believe that happens in the Lehigh County Courthouse anymore, but I could be wrong. Um, and then you're also transitioning socially. I mean, I'm sorry, what I meant to say is medically, which means you're finding a different set of doctors for your child to help them navigate that process. Um, and then I think what I'll mostly be talking about today is the social transition, but all of those are transitions and all of those are um, situations where as a parent, you'll wanna be, um, very comfortable with advocating for your child. And in all of those situations, you'll find that you're coming out over and over again, or you're just correcting people who get it wrong. Um, and I, I think of that as a coming out, like if we go to a doctor's office and a receptionist uh, misgenders my son, 
um, I correct them. I don't wait. I don't force him into the situation where he has to do it because he's going to have years where he's going to have to do that on his own. And I feel like at least until he's 18, I can do that for him. So I think I'd like to take a, a quick break now and just see if there are any questions about um, why it's important for parents to help their children during the coming out process. And then um, if there aren't any questions about that, I'll move on to the next topic. Yeah, so we'll give uh, people a moment or two. You know, it's interesting. So you, you mentioned, you know, when you first, you know, your first coming out, right? And and uh, uh, I will just say that my first coming out was amazingly similar. It was on a New Year's Eve with our oldest friends in the world, and there was definitely too much wine involved. And uh, uh, the, the good news is, is that, uh, you know, after a, a moment or two of stunned silence, you know, they, they said it doesn't matter. And they're, they are still our best and our oldest friends. So it's That's important, wonderful. I think, for people to realize that there are more good people in the world than bad people. Right. Yes. So I think Nicholas has a question. Nicholas, why don't you go ahead and type that in the chat? That's uh, how we're going to do questions tonight. So we'll let you take a moment to type that in, if you would. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, and, and I think that's one of the things that people don't necessarily realize with trans folk is that coming out never really ends, right? Especially as you have to deal with medical settings or things like that, right? It can really have an impact for sure. Definitely. My kid will transition. So it says my kid will transition to the big kids school. I'm assuming that means high school. Not sure what the question there is yet. So we'll give it another second. Um, but yeah, you know, and I think that, you know, the whole concept, and this might be something that we're speaking to a little bit is that, um, how do you navigate coming out in the school system? Who needs to know? When do they need to know? Things like that. Any piece um, of for the school transition. Yep. So the um, question, the question is, is so when they're, when they're transitioning into elementary school, um, you know, is a five-year-old. So any, any advice around that? So um, I, I think my advice for this, um, really, because you're going to a new school and um, a lot of the kids may not know your child, um, number one is that decision. Do you want your child to be stealth or do you want your child to be out? Because I, I, you have a moment where, where um, that's probably in, within your hands. Um, but let's say you, you have chosen for your child to be out or, um, okay, Great, thank you. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, or um, maybe the friends from daycare will go to the same school or something. So they're um, already out. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I would say, and this is what I did, um, I don't know if it works for everybody. Um, I'm, it, you know, every situation's different, so please don't take it like an edict. But, um, you know, when my son was um, transitioning at school, um, I had this false belief that he was the first trans child in the district, which probably wasn't true. But um, so I really got very, okay, I have to clear the path and educate people. Um, and, and I think to some degree that it was true that I did need to educate some people. But I uh, set up a meeting with um, the principal of the school. It was a small elementary school. Uh, who was the person who was gonna be his teacher, his guidance counselor and the school nurse, I believe. And I explained who my son was, and I kind of like read the room to find out if there was going to be any issues there, and there was not. And then they talked to me about what I was scared of, which I thought um, was extremely kind of them to ask. And so the guidance counselor agreed to like, kind of like keep an eye on uh, what was going on, for example, during lunch or recess, and just make sure kids weren't bullying my kid. Um, that, that was... Uh, my biggest concern. And then when he came out, um, out, out in fourth grade, because it took us a while to change his actual names. Okay. The bathrooms, I'll get into that too. Um, I, again, I met with his teacher because uh, it, it was a different teacher at that point. And, um, you can really turn school staff into your allies. Um, when it comes to bathrooms, you know, it is scary. And some of this has, I think you need to read the school environment to know if your child's safe or not. Um, I can't tell you about the safety of your school environment, but I can say that um, your child has a right to um, use the bathroom that matches their identity. And you have a right to fight for that. And if you do fight for that, you will win. Um, the law is in your favor. Um, 
Now, I didn't fight for that for many years for my son, and I regret that. Um, for all of his elementary years, he used a separate bathroom. Uh, he, it was either the nurse's bathroom or um, a teacher's bathroom. And, you know, the problem with that is it's only two bathrooms that are available in a very big school that are hard to get to. And if you can imagine a little kid walking into the teacher's bathroom and not everybody knows why he's using it. And so if somebody's walking by, they're like, what's going on here, which is really embarrassing for the kid. Um, what ended up happening is my um, child would intentionally dehydrate himself, which caused some health problems later. So, you know, on the one hand, you're hoping for safety for your child, but on the other hand, you're create maybe creating some other problems that are also bad. Um, and I don't, I will never sit here and say what the right answer is for another family, but I will help you to weigh all the pros and cons, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's worthwhile saying that. So federal courts have actually, what they have ruled is, in fact, locally here, and the, the federal circuit court here is that what they said is that, you know, um, school bathrooms are actually considered to be semi-private spaces or not private spaces. And so um, that right to privacy that everybody supposedly sues on is not um, recognized in a public restroom or in a school restroom or locker room. And actually, if somebody has a problem using the same restroom as the trans kid, then they're the ones that should go to the nurse's restroom, frankly, is what they say. That's what the law says. Um, now, getting people to recognize the law is always a problem. But I think Allie made a really good point that, you know, if you go to the school principal, you go to the guidance counselor and you start to pave the way, um, you're going to create a group of allies in the school. And I think the other thing that's really positive, is, especially with younger kids, right, is it just sort of becomes normalized, um, you know, over time, as opposed to, you know, when you come out, you know, I came out at the age of 50. And, you know, I it was a whole lot more work, you know, and communication about the people that I needed to talk to, than it is necessarily when you're, you know, five, and you have a smaller social circle. So I think there's some real advantages there. Um, so yeah. Good on you for being an ally and a great parent. Exactly. The only other thing that um, while you were talking, I thought of is that elementary school children tend to be very accepting. They, they haven't learned to be uh, hateful yet for the most part. Um, and at least kindergarten through about second grade, they're all going to the bathroom together with a teacher near them. They're, they're not like, it's not a free for all in the bathroom. So, you know, as long as you know, for sure that the teacher is an ally with you, I, I think your child's pretty safe. It's, it's not until they get a little older that, um, you know, bathrooms become places where kids can get into mischief because there's no adults around. Um, that happens kind of at a later age. And, and, and thankfully it's at an age where your child might be real, a really good read of the situation. Okay, um, I think I'll get, I, I wanna go back to um, the prepared remarks because they kind of mirror um, what we're talking about now. And I, I wanted to get into why it's so scary to come out and why we trip over our words. And, and it's because we have like very real fears about what's gonna happen when we tell people, um, you know, when you're talking to family members, you do worry about estrangement, you worry about people turning their backs on you. And for me, I was like, fine, if somebody, isn't going to be our family anymore. Bye bye. But but it's hurtful to your child, and so that is is definitely a very big fear. And same with like ridicule. Um, as human beings, uh, we um, we don't like when people don't like us. And so this is something to I think sit with personally, so that you can um, know why you're so uncomfortable. Um, sometimes we like to, at least I like to tell myself all of my fear is about my child, but some of it was really about me. <laughs> it was really about, oh, someone's not gonna like me. Uh, I'm gonna be embarrassed, for example. Someone, you know, and once I got that out of the way, my personal fears coming out for my child was very easy because I could just turn into mama bear. And, and nothing was stopping me from becoming mama bear. So um, I think one of the other fears, obviously we worry about our children becoming, getting bullied, but I like to put that in a separate place because, um, and hopefully I'll remember to talk about it later. There are solutions and things you can do, proactive things you can do as a parent, but those are separate from coming out. 
And so it, it, they shouldn't really be um, part of your thought process uh, of whether or not to tell people, except unless you're trying to decide if you should move and keep your child self. Um, and then I think one of the biggest things that stops us is, is that we don't know what to say. And so um, one of my uh, biggest pieces of advice is to like practice with somebody that is an ally and to get a couple lines down that are just like, um, ready for you, uh, especially with strangers, um, because you'll, you'll be coming out with strangers for years. And it used to take in the beginning when people would ask me about my daughter, I used to just um, evade the whole conversation because I didn't know what to tell them and whether I wanted to tell them and whether they deserved to know and this whole thing. And then eventually I got to the point where I was like, well, I actually don't have a daughter. I have a son. Um, and then if they asked a question, I would answer the question, but I would just be very matter of fact about it. Um, and you'll get all sorts of responses to that. Um, my next door neighbor backed away and said, none of my business. <laughs> um, one of my family members just said something like these things happen and I could like read all the, the negative thoughts in their mind, but they weren't saying them. And, you know, and I was just like, well, that's on them. That says more about them. It doesn't say anything about us. And um, one thing that I do want to say about other people is that you want to give them time. A lot of people, if, I, if you think about the stages of grief or the stages of change, um, people are going to move through those stages. So um, like when I first told my mother who my son was, my mother asked me all of the same questions I had asked myself six months before. <laughs> so it was like, well, what if this is a phase this, you know, like, and I got um, extremely irritated with her because it was the typical mother daughter thing where I felt like, oh, she doesn't trust me. She doesn't think I'm smart enough. And then finally I just said, you know, I've known this for a while. I've done a lot of research. It would be nice if you could trust me. Before you start asking me questions, I would like you to read a book. And I told her which books to read and to her credit, she did. And by the end of those books, she was on board. And the beautiful thing about having her on board is she told the rest of that side of the family. I didn't have to tell my brothers. I didn't have to tell my sister-in-law. I didn't have to tell my grandparents. She took care of all of those people. Um, and I'm not saying you always have someone in your life like my mom, but um, once she like understood that this was real, uh, she made helped make my life and my son's life a lot easier. Um, and then there are some people who will, um, they won't just, well, they're, I guess they're stuck in denial, but they're sort of like in this other place too, where they're accusatory of you. Um, I had two different in-laws who messaged me. One of them was so concerned that I was taking my daughter's innocence away. And another one was telling me, oh, we support our love, our nephew. But then in the next sentence told me I should be taking my nephew to a different therapist, someone who is more Christian, basically. And, you know, I was very wounded by their remarks to the point I was ready to never talk to either one of them again. And so was my husband. But, you know, a few years later, one of them actually came up to me and apologized to me for, you know, and I would have never brought it up to her. I was just, okay, we, we won't talk about that. And it was a day when my um, son was on the beach, topless, running through the water, having a great time. And she put her arm around me and she said, I I'm sorry for how I reacted. So you won't always get those, but just know that people need to move through their own grief and they, they will almost always start in denial. And it doesn't mean that they're, they're going to stay there. Um, and just see if I forgot to, oh, I wanted to say about coming out over and over and over again. <laughs> so um, my son's been out for years at this point. I'm not sure how many years. And I kind of forgot about coming out. And um, he and I were walking and it was during the middle of COVID and um, somebody that I knew from work from many years ago recognized us and pulled her car over and got out and was talking to me. Like, you know, we were like a uh, very nice conversation and my son's next to me and she looks at me and she goes, so how, how's your daughter? And I was just like, looked at my son and I was like, no daughter, I have a son. <laughs> I didn't know what else to say because I was so out of practice and she was so uncomfortable because I could see in her mind. She's like, I swear I thought she had a daughter. 
And she's not even like putting like that he's trans together. Like she's just confused. And um, after that conversation, as we were walking home, I apologized to him. I said, you know, I'm so sorry. You were, I know you had to have been as uncomfortable as I was. And I'm just out of practice. I, I forgot that people don't know there's P and that there's going to be some people in my life who still ask and who just don't know who you are, you know? Um, and so that after that, I, I kind of went through my mind. I'm like, what do I really need to tell people so that they understand? And cause this person would have been supportive. I just sort of blew it, you know? Um, so anyway, um, I want to see, I think some questions came up and so I'll take another break and yeah, we, we do. You know, And I just wanted, before we get to the questions, I just wanted to talk about that idea that, you know, always keeping the door open. Yeah. Right. That, you know, it does take some people longer than others to kind of get there. And, um, you know, sooner or later, somebody's going to surprise you pleasantly. You will probably get some negative surprises as well, but, but, um, you know, you'll cherish those good ones for sure. So here's a question or a comment. So my child just turned six and only two weeks ago decided to change pronouns and is now struggling with a name change, uh, name choice. I don't want to push them to pick something right away but he's returning to school in August and I have to make sure I'm able to pave the way for him. How do I support him in choosing a name? Oh, such a good question. Um, so it's really hard because at age six, they pick these names that you know, they're not going to want for the rest of their life. Um, and that, I think that's probably why it took me years to finish my son's social and legal transitions because he was like, Oh, call me sky. And we went through sky for a while and then it was like, no, I, I want my name to be blue. And then it was red. And I'm like, are we going to go through all the colors? Um, you know, it was like, it was 17 different names, Gavin, the, you know, and some of them were like, okay, you might stay with Gavin, but then even that name didn't last very long. And so I was like, I don't want to tell everybody that this is his name and then have him change it. Um, and then at, at some point after, like we kept missing the, the time that we could transition for school, like summer would come and I'm like, hey, we have to have a name. So I could, and then it, we'd not have a name. And then the next school year would start because I didn't want to do it halfway through the year. Um, and I think we did do it halfway through the year because at some point I was like, hey, let's just shorten your name. Take all the letters away. There's only three letters left and that's what your name will be. And he was like, fine. Um, and one thing I would like to say is that then he picked his own middle name, which was after a soccer player, I believe. And very recently he decided he wanted to change it. And I'd already gone through the legal change process. And I was just like, you know, I was so worried years ago that you would want to change your name again. And here you want to change it. And I'm realizing it's really no big deal. <laughs> like, I know how to change your name. We'll just do it. You could have seven different names. It's no big deal. Um, so I, you know, I, in terms of helping your child change their name, um, I, I think as a parent, you know, what they're not going to want to stick with and you don't want to, um, allow them to go with a name that in three years, they're going to want to change again, just for their own school benefit. Um, but that said, uh, like involve them in the process, one of the things that we did is we involved other family members, particularly my mom, and made it sort of like um, how it was when um, he was in, when I was pregnant and other people were like coming up with names, you know, and we made it really fun, like going back and forth. What about this name? What about this name? And just, you know, none of that led anywhere, but um, it, it turned it into like a fun activity that allowed us all to bond rather than something that was stressful, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, so just some things that we do, this is more with adult trans folk, but we say, you know, if you want to try out a name, go to Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So you go, go to Starbucks and you order a cup of coffee or, you know, something non-caffeinated for a kid, right? And, and you know, you have them give them the name and then if they call it out and you go like, oh yeah, that, you know, that, you know, and then you can, you can try on five names a day that way if you really want to, you just got to have enough money for Starbucks. But, um, exactly. but you know, kind of a way and the same kind of, you know, like, you know, the baby book, baby name book or whatever it is. There are all ways that you kind of can do that. Um, so one of the concerns of the same individual says, that, you know, the parent isn't sure if their child is trans or non-binary. Yes. Um, I think that's a situation where you really want to involve a gender therapist. Um, I, I don't feel like I have the expertise to help other people 
and, and their children know their gender, but um, it is something that gender therapists specialize in. Um, I should have thought to have resources for gender therapists in this area. Dr. Angelo, I, I drove more than an hour to see her, but I think there's people closer, closer now that can help you. Um, CHOP is, is great. Um, I, I'm, that's in Philadelphia though. And same with Mazzoni Center. So I will post a yeah. list in the okay. chat of, um, of, uh, research, of therapists, at least for the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I, I think I'm about to go off on a tangent. I'm not sure if I, I, I want to even go there, but I think people outside of a trans person, like, you know, parents and extended family want to have something for sure um, and want to label. And sometimes you just have to wait and be very creative and flexible um, with your child and allow your child to decide who they are. And, and that's especially true when, um, kids come out like as teenagers, there's a really common sort of transition process where um, they'll come out first as gay. And then after that, they'll come out as maybe non-binary and then eventually come out as trans. Like it's, it's sort of like these little baby steps that are going in a certain direction. So, um, you know, just like really being uh, welcoming to every discovery, uh, as you would be as if your um, child was discovering anything else about themselves, like, you know, they're discovering what their hobbies are and their interests are and all of these other things that make them awesome human beings. And, and this is just another discovery process. Yeah. And, and, you know, more and more young people in particular right, are identifying as non-binary. Um, many people who identify non-binary don't necessarily identify as trans, they identify as cisgender. Yeah. So um, I think it is okay to let the kid be a kid and to sort of experiment. Um, that can be frustrating for us. Um, but um, as you know, parents who just sort of kind of want to like land on a process and go, but um, you know, it takes time to process this stuff as, you know, think about the work that you do as the parent. Now imagine the work that that kid is doing. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the question was, so prior to the legal name change, were teachers and everyone else calling um, your child by their dead name or did he use different names every year? Um, he, before we actually changed his name at school, he used his old name um, until he was ready to change it. So when we were trying out different names, we usually did that outside of school. So for example, like on vacation, or, um, if we were somewhere where nobody knew us, uh, like uh, at a pool or wherever, like we would go to the pool and, and he's like, I'm going to be Kevin today. I'm like, okay, you're Kevin. And of course I'd forget because whatever, but I would try. Um, it's really hard to get used to saying like a different name every week or two, but, um, you know, we, we would, and sometimes even at home, we would just uh, try on different names at home, but, you know, we only socially transitioned him to a new name once with his friends and the, his extended community. Yeah. And, and somebody made a comment about, so their um, child is 15, so a little bit older, right? And so, you know, how is that different compared to, you know, maybe an elementary school age child and um, I don't know if you have any comments on that or thoughts. Yeah, on that. Um, I, I think they're they're a little more able to direct the process um, because they know. Like the thing with adolescents, where I, I find parents have a hard time, is the adolescents are way ahead of their parents. They're like they they come home one day and they come out and they're like, "I'm ready for hormones. I'm ready for this. I'm changing my name to this." Like they they've been thinking about it for months, and the, and the parents like, "What? What?" And they you know is way, many steps behind. Um, and I I actually do know some kids who have changed their minds about their names, and I want to say it's really not a big deal. Like it. Um, I know one child uh, was a high school student who picked one name at one point and then like six months later picked a different name and everybody just switched to the new name and it was no big deal. So I think when people really love someone, they don't think twice about treating them with respect and calling someone by the name that they want to be called is a form of respect. Um, yeah. Will yeah. there be people in their lives that aren't respectful? Yes, but also as a parent, you'll teach your child how to deal with that. 
you know, I always, the way, when I talk to people about names and pronouns, I always mention The Rock, right? So everybody knows who The Rock is, who actually yeah. grew up with where, where Ali and I are. But I mean, but is that, you know, why do people call The Rock The Rock? It's not his legal <laughs> name, right? They call him The Rock because that's what he wants to be called. Same thing for Katy Perry and uh, um, exactly. Martha Stewart, you know, that's yeah. not, that's not her legal name. So it's okay to kind of go by, you know, in, in the cisgender world, we would just call it a nickname, right? Yep. So, you know, people change their names and they use aliases all the time. Yes. So um, I think it's okay to let people sort of have that freedom to explore. Um, you know, the job of a parent is to just to help regulate a little bit sometimes. Yeah. So here's a, a comment says, my daughter doesn't know that she's trans. She's going to turn five in October. What age do we explain to her what the term transgender means and that she's a beautiful trans person. Wow. That's amazing. So I, I have to make some assumptions here and I'm just gonna say what my assumptions are and then maybe you can comment and let me know if I'm assuming incorrectly. Um, but so I, I'm assuming your, your daughter was um, kind of identifying as a girl uh, for years. And so you realized that this child identifies as a girl um, and so you you um, encourage that, but then your your daughter doesn't know that her uh, I will say body parts are different from the body parts of other girls. Is is that what the question is? And since she right after she did. okay, so she said I'm a girl. Yeah. So so I'll just say this okay. that um, I figured out that I wasn't a girl when I was four years old and was okay. playing doctor with the little girl next door. <laughs> right. And yeah. so, you know, you know, immediately like came home and, you know, was asking lots of questions about why my equipment was different and then trying to figure out how to get it off. So, uh -huh. um, you know, probably you need to start, I would think, start having these conversations because they're going to, you know, kids aren't stupid. They're going to figure it out. Exactly. And, and if you don't have the conversations, um, I've heard some very harrowing stories of kids trying to, um, basically do surgery on themselves. So you definitely don't want that to happen. Oh, she knows that. Okay. Yeah. I would, well, I, one way that I would explain it is, um, say that some girls have a vagina, some girls have penises, like, like completely normalize it, that her body is, is, uh, is still is beautiful, normalize the situation. At some point she may decide to have a different body and that's on her, um, if that makes sense. Well, she doesn't know how big of a deal it is. So you're, you're, I think this is about society. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that there's, there's a really a good answer to that, yeah. but I think that, you know, getting a good therapist is going to be a big, yeah. yeah, this is a, a I, it's, really, I can't really overstate the value of having a good gender therapist. Um, and I think as parents, we worry a little too far ahead for our kids. But if you, if you have a, a gender therapist in the mix, they'll be able to tell you, um, suggest books, for example, for that are age appropriate for your daughter, um, suggest, um, you, you know, different, um, Things they'll like role play with you on how, how to talk to other people and what to do with the school. And, and occasionally, if you need it, they'll act, they'll go to the school and educate people for you, too, for obviously um, for a price sometimes. But um, the, the gender therapists that I know sometimes don't do it like they'll do slide. They just really want to change the world. So, um, yeah, I, I don't I don't know if I can give like great advice for this situation. I, I just want to encourage you to be honest with your daughter. Um, but also to champion her and her body. Like um, the more that you can normalize and celebrate her, the better. Okay. I think that's where I think we're caught up. Okay. Um, so then I wanted to get into, oh, wait a minute. You know what? I already talked about my next sec section by um, accident already. Um, okay. I, I wanted to talk to how people respond and I already um, said a few of these, but um, you'll get different responses from people when you come out. Some people will just be automatically positive. Other people will be what I call micro aggressively positive. And, and that was the, um, oh, we love our nephew, but 
have you thought about another therapist? But that, that's sort of like a microaggression, right? Um, and some of them will just be awkward. They don't know what to say. It doesn't really mean that they don't, they won't very soon come around and, and, and uh, support you. Um, but you'll, you will have some people who are very supportive of your particular child, but not of transgender people in general. And i I personally have the hardest time with those people. Um, I have a few of them in my life where, um, they would do anything for my family, uh, very supportive of us. And I do think probably my son might've been the first transgender person they ever knew in real life. And it, it completely changed them in their worldview. But even though they are so supportive of us, they also share really horrific memes on social media or um, get their language wrong consistently, <laughs> you know, and, and they haven't taken steps to fix all of that. And they'll still say the transgenders, for example, or um, misgender people, uh, like for example, they might be talking about Dr. Levine and misgender her. Or, you know, and I always push back on these things and I say, like, that's hurtful. I find that hurtful. Um, but, you know, at some point you have to make a decision whether or not to keep certain people in your life, even if they are sort of supportive, but they're sort of not supportive. So I just wanted to mention that um, because some people are like halfway supportive and I, I always struggled with what to do with people like that. Um, I wanted to get down to how to come out. Um, and I really only have a few tips. One is to figure out your, your few sentences that you can say to strangers, because you're going to be saying those few sentences for a long time and, and, and know that you, you, you'll have a choice of whether or not to come out to certain people like, um, your hairstylist, for example, has probably talked to you about your child before and remembers a certain gender of your child. And every time you sit down, that person, because they're trying to be a good customer service is gonna ask you how your child is. Um, I ended up leaving and not going back to my stylist who probably would have been supportive, but I, for some reason, I just didn't feel like talking about it there. Um, and I'm not saying I did the right thing, but um, in talking to other parents, apparently that's a very common reaction. So I don't know if it's like, we, you know, when you sit down in a stylist chair, you just don't want to have stress and coming out as stressful. I don't know what that's about. Um, for closer family members, I would say have a book on the ready and some website resources on the ready because you really don't have to be the person who educates people. That is a lot of um, emotional labor on your part. And um, these books have already been written and they're doing the education for you. So I would, you know, explain who your child is, tell people you really want them to be there for your child, because if they're not there for your child, it would be very hurtful. And then say, hey, this is a lot to wrap your mind around. It sure was a lot for me, but here's this book, please read it. And then we can talk. Um, and that way you're not stuck for hours with somebody peppering you with somewhat aggressive questions because you don't really need to put up with that. Um, and you will have family members who struggle initially and that's gonna be very hurtful for you. And I, I think it's really important to own how you feel and to verbalize that with people. Um, one of the things I used to like to say, and I, I tried to write this down, so I'm just gonna read it, is I would say, I know this is hard. It's so, so hard. It was hard for me and I'm seeing that it's hard for you. Um, I went through these stages of grief too. I, there was a time when I was in denial, but um, I realized this is real and I'm really hoping that you come to realize this is real too. Um, you know, you would say your child's name could really use your love and support because we're in a world that doesn't have a lot of that for kids like him or, or whatever gender your child is. Um, and, and then I would say like, take time to digest it. Let's not finish the conversation now. I would give them a book and I would say, you know, learn what you can. Um, and I just need to leave you with this. Your criticism hurts. It hurts deeply. Um, and then I would let it go. And that really helps people to understand that they're not being helpful. Like they need to know that they're not being helpful <laughs> when they come at you and try to change your mind about who your child is. Um, they think that they're doing you a favor and they're not, they're, they're hurting you. And they, I think you have a right to say that. 
Um, so I, you don't have to yell at them. I, I hardly ever lose my temper with people, but I have been known to um, shut people up really fast without raising my voice. And I think it's like you, honesty minus anger is power. Like that's when you can really um, encourage people to do the right thing. Um, so again, I, I just want to stop and see if there's any other questions before I get into how to be a better ally and friend. Okay. Oh, YouTube. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. 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 So YouTube is super helpful for explaining tough topics to my six-year-old kiddo. Queer kid stuff is, is one that we follow often. Okay. That's one. Good. Right. Yeah. There's a bear involved in it. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, I wanted to kind of come back to this idea of stealth or not. Yes. Right? And, um, you know, so is going stealth a good option? And, you know, I, I think that that's everybody's individual decision, but, you know, um, at some point, you know, more than likely in a medical setting, um, you know, there's going to have to be a coming out conversation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes I think it can be helpful to be out so that you sort of, you know, our family members are mentally prepared for that situation when it's going to come. Yes, definitely. Um, oh, so, I, so somebody want to know what stealth is. Oh, so, good, 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 good. See, it's, it's so good that you're asking questions because I forget um, that I didn't know what these terms meant at one point too. It just means, um, so a, a child can... Um, transition how they look. Um, so for example, um, we thought my son was a girl and he transitioned how he looks. And, and so everybody thinks he's a boy. And for there were periods of his life where he'd have new friends and they didn't know that he was trans. They just saw a boy. And so that would be stealth. Like, and he would have a decision of whether or not to tell them. Um, or like, let's say he presents as a boy, everybody who sees them, sees him, um, what it reads him as a boy, and then you move somewhere else where nobody knows you, then you have the option of being stealth. And then um, you would only come out to people that you want to come out to. Um, what I wanted to say about stealth is um, I was trying to decide make when I was trying to make this decision for my son, I talked to a lot of trans people. It's really helpful to go to conferences and ask them if they were ever stealth or in the closet and what that was like for them. And when I heard their stories about how hard it was um, to be stealth and how stressful it was to always be worrying if someone's going to find out, um, especially in bathrooms, um, is someone going to figure it out? Um, I was like, no, we're not. That's why I decided not to do that. Um, and and, and I, we would have gone that route if it had been too dangerous to be out, um, I, knowing like we, we can do that if we have to. Um, but it's not without its own cons. I just, there, there are some cons to that. So somebody commented that um, the Gender Cool Project has a, um, some great tools uh, and role models for kids. That's, That's absolutely wonderful. true. Yeah, they're great. Okay. All right. Looks like that's it for the minute. Okay. Okay. So I just wanted to talk about being an ally and a friend. Um, you know, when my son was in elementary school, I, for the longest time, I didn't really know who was with us and who was against us. And obviously there were a lot of people who didn't know anything about us, but, um, and I kind of had this sense everywhere I went that I would look at people and try to decide and, you know, trying to sort the, the scary people from the safe people. And I'm sitting on this playground and I see these two women talking and they keep sort of like looking over at me. And I, I in my mind, I'm thinking they're gossiping about us, right? That's what I'm thinking. And then one of them comes over and sits next to me and she happens to be the mother of um, a girl that had gone to daycare with my son. So she knew my son and his former aspect and I don't know what's gonna happen next. And I'm just like kind of bracing for it. And she says to me, I just want you to know that I think you're wonderful. I think everything your family about it is about is wonderful. I am so here for you. I love Ari. 
please, you know, I know that I don't remember exactly how she said this, but like, kind of like, it's a hard world and I want to be here for you. And I just thought that was the most loving gesture from somebody who was like, basically just an acquaintance. Like, I, and, and she and I are like very close friends now, but we, I don't know if we would have become close friends had it not been for that moment. Um, and so I think like, that is like a beautiful ally thing to do is to walk up to people and tell them that they're safe, that, that you have their back. Um, and one thing I would say that I don't know if all parents feel this way, but there's something that um, allies and supporters say that I've always found it's always made me a little uncomfortable. Um, they say things like um, your child is so lucky to have you. And I think that makes me uncomfortable because it makes it almost sound like my child is hard to love. And, you know, and I don't feel that way. I feel like my child's pretty dang awesome. And that um, no matter, I mean, I know some parents are not the best parents of trans kids. I'm not uh, negating that, but I, I feel like anybody could love my child. He's, he's a great human being. And so like when people say that, I don't know what to say back. And it's like really uncomfortable for me to be like, okay, thanks. I, I, I still love my child. That doesn't make me a hero. Like that's a parent's job is to love their child. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I kind of caution people against going that route, telling a parent that they're a hero or that, um, their kid is so lucky to have them or that they're so brave. Like, all of those comments, for whatever reason, they've always made me uncomfortable. And I don't know if other parents feel the same way, but I just wanted to put it out there. Um, the thing that I really want to hear from people is the thing that I almost never hear, which is um, come up and tell me how you're going to change the world for my child. That's what I want to hear. You know, come up and say, oh, you know, um, I see that uh, <laughs> the politicians are right now um, demonizing trans kids about sports. Um, what is something that I can do? You know, like if, if you came up to me and said that, I would probably hug you and cry um, because we need allies to um, fight these, these horrible things that are happening. Um, you know, show up when we need help, whether it's at school board meetings or um, municipal meetings, whether or, um, you know, at the state legislature, be willing to call and write representatives, um, you know, be willing to support drag queen story hour if it's around, you know, any of those things um, really go a long way. Uh, and, and they do help change minds. I, I think like, I, I heard a study that it only takes about 30% of people to believe in something for the rest of people to follow along. And so if we have 30% of our population as strong allies, you'll take the other 70% with you. And so um, you're, you're very powerful and we need you. You know, it, it's interesting you mentioned the, the word brave, right? Because when people say to me like, oh, you're so brave, it's like, well, first off, it isn't a matter of brave. It's a matter of survival for me. Yeah. Right. And by the way, you know, I need you to be brave. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you should be brave. Right. Um, you know, and, and I want to come back, you know, while we're waiting for some final kind of comments here as we wrap up things. But is um, this idea of, you know, especially for, you know, when you're concerned about your, your kid coming out in school. And it's important to know that, you know, trans kids have been going to school for ever. And most school systems have dealt with trans kids in the past. Yeah. And they, you know, while they may not have been public about it, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, believe me, they were dealing with it. And they just dealt with it on a case by case basis. And they figured out a way to muddle through and help those kids get a good education and, you know, graduate and go on to have a good life most school administrators want to do the right thing. That doesn't mean that there aren't some jerks out there because there are, but that's, uh, you know, your job as a parent is to kind of get out there and advocate when you run into those people. But, um, you know, your kid is more than likely not the first trans kid in a school system. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. So we'll just wait a second or two here and see if there are any final questions or comments. And in the meanwhile, Ali, I'll just, you know, thank you for all the wonderful work that you do. 
Um, Allie is also a member of her local school board and had a great meeting last night and uh, uh, talking about all kinds of wonderful issues, none of which had anything to do with trans kids, by the way. And um, uh, but uh, she just does a lot of fantastic work uh, on our community and is just a, a resource for all the, the mama bears and papa bears that are out there. And I just want to thank you for that. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions or comments. Um, this will be recorded and be up on our um, uh, YouTube site here in a bit. Um, and um, we do have a question about, um, so can we share emails or phones? And so Ali, maybe you wanna talk about some of the Facebook groups that are out there? Yes. Um, it, and I'll, I'll talk about these very honestly because I'm a little conflicted about them, to be honest. Um, there's a huge Facebook group called something like Parents of Trans Kids that has thousands of people in there. But the problem with having thousands of people in a Facebook group is um, some bad actors periodically will infiltrate that group, screenshot people's photos, and then post them somewhere else and dox people. So I, I personally don't ever comment in that group anymore, but um, nonetheless, I think it's a good thing. It's just, um, sadly, these are the times that we live in. And so, you know, I don't know that I believe Facebook groups are the best option for people now with organizing. And I, I, I don't know what <laughs> the better option is. I, I think maybe like at some point it'll be a Slack group because you can, um, you know, you always know who's in, in your Slack. But um, that said, I, I think maybe there's a way that we could, um, if there's a lot of allies here, they, that um, you could maybe message Corinne with yep. uh, phone information and email information and we can share that way. Yeah, so um, I was gonna say that there's probably a couple of things. So um, many uh, LGBTQ community centers, I know that the one that we have locally here in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania um, have um, uh, support groups for parents of trans kids and they trade stories and war stories and assets and, um, uh, you know, information all the time. Uh, matter of fact, the one that's locally uh, is led by a, a woman who is a rock star and who uh, they're also meeting virtually right now. So, you know, they can have people from all over the country uh, doing it just like we have people for our groups. Um, you certainly can take advantage of the support organizations that we run. So uh, lvrenaissance.org, um, uh, sorry, renaissancelv.org. Um, has, uh, we run five different support groups and two of which are open to allies, one of which is for spouses. Um, and then there's also the one that I just mentioned for parents or trans kids. If you wanted to email me, uh, my email address is Corinne, C-O-R-I-N-N-E dot Goodwin, G-O-O-D-W-I-N at P-A trans equity dot org. And you can email me at that address and I'll be happy to connect you with Allie. Yeah. And I do think um, virtual support groups, whether they're at Bradbury Sullivan, um, through, through the, the ones that were just mentioned, um, CHOP has some, uh, Mazzoni has some, and then the, even nationally gender spectrum. And there's a few other groups. Those are great. Um, please don't. Uh, the thing that I said about Facebook is only about Facebook. Um, the other support groups, uh, they are, <laughs> people are heavily vetted before they're allowed to enter. So you, you don't have to worry about the issues for those. And, and they were great places to meet other parents and other like-minded people. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, an important thing to remember is that, listen, it's your kid, right? And your kid isn't necessarily going to be going through the same things as someone else's kid. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, uh, Ali mentioned CHOP and somebody just mentioned CHOP. So CHOP, for those who are like maybe from like California, Florida, is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And uh, they are amazing. And I'm sure that they would be more than happy to, to help out in any way. Yeah. Can I, can I mention one other thing, just because I, I know a lot of people don't know about it, um, especially if uh, you have a, um, a trans kid that needs some support. Um, one of the hardest things is that they're surrounded by people who aren't trans. Um, and, and there are some support groups in this area and that's great, but um, one of the best gifts you can give your child is to send him, them, sorry, to 
um, a camp that is for kids just like them. Um, Bradbury Sullivan has one that's in the area that I think might be a little broader. It might be for queer kids. I, I'm not sure if I'm right. Um, and then there's a little further away in New Hampshire is Harbor Camps Camp Aeronutic, which is a camp for transgender, uh, I, I'm gonna say um, gender non-conforming um, children. And one of the things that's great about these camps is all the counselors are also trans. The people who run the camp are trans. Like um, they get to leave the world of cisgender behind and go to camp and be themselves. Um, and you know, have that experience of this is what the world would be like if the world was perfect, basically. I mean, it's not perfect because the kids still get into fights with each other as, as kids do, but, you know, they, they lose, they can have a week or two or three without all of the discrimination of the world. Yeah. And I, and I will say that, um, so I always mispronounce the name, but the, the camp in New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, <laughs> So uh, we actually give out a, a scholarship to that every year uh, for one kid. Um, and we just uh, awarded that not too long ago here. And then um, we'll be doing that again next year for people who uh, live within our 10 county soon, hopefully to be 14 county service area in Pennsylvania. And then, um, but they also offer discounted rates for people who uh, have a need as well, which is, uh, which is great. All right, so with that, I think we will close it out Ali, thank you so much. You're a champ. I appreciate it. And, Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.